Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so my name is, we're going to get ready to get started. <laughs> so today's topic is entrepreneurial pathways from the dorm room to IPO. My name is Sabrina Tucker Barrett. I'm the uh, co-founder, uh, president and CEO of Girls for Technology, a nonprofit organization located in Hartford. We provide services to women and girls across the state of Connecticut. Um, in the areas of workforce development, K through 12 programming, and um, and I'm sorry, our building for equity program, which is for women entrepreneurs, and so we help them accelerate their business along with um, a pitch competition. So today, I'm really excited to be here, and again, the the topic is around uh, entrepreneurial pathways. In the simplest definition, an entrepreneur is someone who develops an enterprise around an innovation. They manage the business and assume the risks for its success. We as a collective all spend a considerable amount of time celebrating successful entrepreneurs. For startup, startup founders, the journey from idea to any exit may take seven or more years. For those working, for those working on a long-term nonprofit or lifestyle business, the path may be even more challenging in some ways. Oh, do I know. In this panel, we are going to dive into different pathways the entrepreneurs take, and we have an incredible group of people here to help shed light on the different experiences that entrepreneurs have along the way. So if everyone could go around and just introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how the, your journey into entrepreneurship. Yes, they're one end of the other. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so hi, I'm Nell Diamond. I'm the founder and CEO of Hill House Home. Um, we are a fashion and home business based in New York City, ship internationally. Um, we launched, or I launched this business. I'm used to saying we, but since I'm in SOM, I feel like I can say I, circle of trust. Um, I graduated from SOM in 2015. I was part of the entrepreneurship program here and launched the business about five months after graduating from SOM. So SOM was absolutely pivotal in um, fostering this business and incubating this business. Um, prior to that, I worked in a two-year analyst program at a bank in New York, which is the typical thing you do after being an English major undergrad. And here we are eight years later. Cool. So um, I was uh, one of the founders of Hire One back in 2000. So. Uh, uh, almost 25 years ago now, <laughs> crazy to believe. Um, before that, I started the Yale Entrepreneurial Society with the same folks that I started Hire One with, so I'm happy to uh, give a little background on that because there's a lot of history on the um, entrepreneurial sort of stuff at, at Yale over the last 25 years. Um, so I started Hire One. We uh, took it public in 2010, um, and eventually I left my full-time role in 2014. Um, took some time off and then started a venture fund in 2016 called Los Olas Venture Capital, which is what I do now. So a um, little perspective of sort of entrepreneur to venture capitalist. Big fan of YES and YEI. Thank you for that. So I'm Eli Luberoff. I started my company called Desmos when I was an undergrad here um, at Yale. was part of the Entrepreneurial Institute. This was now 12 years ago. Um, and about a year ago, so Desmos were, were math software. Uh, if I don't know if anyone in here has a kid who 
Nice, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we make a, a graphing calculator was our, our foremost product. Uh, goal was to put Texas Instruments out of business. It turns out graphing calculators are like 0.5% of their business. So they're still going strong, but the graphing calculator division is not. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so we did that, and then we also built a middle school math curriculum. And about a year ago, and I think I'll talk about this more later, realized that those two businesses were just wildly different from each other, split the company in half, um, sold our curriculum business, had a nice exit, reincorporated the uh, calculator business as a public benefit corporation that I now run called Desmos Studio, um, serving about 80 million people around the world. Hi, everyone. I'm Raghav Chopra. I'm the founder of Tefra Digital, which is an investment firm I started last year focusing on blockchain and early stage investing. Um, the entrepreneurial path, uh, as Sabrina said, can also be a very long one. So I graduated from Yale in 2006, studied electrical engineering, and then was a tech investor, did the investment banking boot camp, and worked in private equity, and was uh, an equity hedge fund manager for a number of years, and ultimately uh, an interest in a niche emerging technology and all the experience from uh, good and tough bosses um, led me to the entrepreneurial journey of uh, creating an investment firm. <coughs> Hi everyone, my name is Nora Kaldi. I'm the founder of Neurochas. My background, I'm actually a pure mathematician and computer scientist by background. I worked in drug discovery at the interface between industry and academia for a lot of my career, um, identifying new computational ways to find new drugs. And then I came into the area of nutrition afterwards and realized that this area was ripe for disruption. Um, if you think about it, a lot of the products we consume every day are actually causing huge health concerns. So it's, let's say if you take food as an example, um, it's a 10 trillion industry today causing a 6.6 .6 trillion problem, healthcare problem, and that's massive. And that's because of the ingredients that are used within these products. So a lot of these ingredients are very old, they're 50 to 100 years old, they're unhealthy, and they're, they, need to, they need to be changed. So we invented a technology that's AI-based. Uh, Neurotas has this technology that can discover active molecules a lot faster and take them to market within this area, replacing a lot of these molecules in everyday food products and consumer products we're, we're consuming today. So we've uh, uh, built the technology. Um, I, I actually moved from Ireland to here, so the company's based out of both US and Ireland. Uh, a lot of the science is carried out still in Ireland. And uh, from a sales perspective, we're selling in the US. So a lot of the products with our ingredients within are currently uh, available all, all over the US. So that's myself. Thank you. Uh, that's cool. I look forward to hearing more uh, about that baby even after the pill. That's super cool. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Scott Wagner. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently the CEO of a company called GoodRx. Before that, I was the CEO of a company called GoDaddy for, uh, for a while. And my background is with uh, a big private equity firm called KKR you know, before that. So I might be, I'm not sure I'm the end of the panel and the end of the journey, but <laughs> I, I, this is now the fourth or fifth company that I've then had the honor, I'd say, of taking it from a founder uh, through a, a next leg of its journey. And so, uh, you know, I think me even being here and entrepreneurialism it doesn't stop with the founder and a great company that can live and evolve in many ways is something super special. Uh, anyway, so it's great to be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having us all. Awesome. So we're going to kick the conversation off with Mark. So you're currently a VC, but your LinkedIn profile states that you're an entrepreneur turned VC. Can you help us understand your journey and what led you to being a founder of VC? Yeah, sure. So um, as I sort of started saying a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I started Hire One um, as a senior in college. So it was 1999. Um, and it was really a company that automated university back offices. Part of it is we were, you know, my co-founders and I, we were all in our early 20s. We didn't know much, but we knew what was broken in universities because that's kind of, that was our world. And so we automated back offices in terms of financial aid distribution, payments, eventually all kinds of data collection, and we had different divisions. We then took the company public in 2010, um, and in 2014, we decided to take it private again. Um, and at that point, um, I said, it's enough for me, 15 years, I need a break. Um, and so I left, I stayed on the board till the transaction finished, 
Um, and then we're sort of looking for what to do next. And, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs really want to do their next thing and start something new. But I really thought about it and said, you know, I'm not sure I have a great idea. I don't know that I want to work that hard again. Because I think one of the things <laughs> that's really important is as an entrepreneur, especially an early stage company, you're working 24-7. And even at a big company, I mean, when we went public, we were about $250 million in revenue, about 1,000 employees. You're constantly on the clock. Like somebody has a problem every day, all the time, and it's always your problem. And so I said, I just don't want to do that anymore. And thankfully, you know, I, I consider myself retired at 35, and I said, you know, I want to do something that is just better work-life balance. And I think that's important. I see a lot of entrepreneurs who want that work-life balance, and that doesn't work. If you're going to be an entrepreneur and start a company, you have to be all in. And so I said, I want to do something where I can do more intellectual processing, more thinking, and less doing. And that's why I started the Venture Capital Fund. It's still a lot of work, and I'm always thinking about venture capital and my portfolio companies, but I'm doing a lot less, and, and I really like that transition. I think I can apply a lot of the skills I learned in the 15 years of being an entrepreneur, um, and now kind of share that with our portfolio companies, with our CEOs, but less sort of hands-on than I used to be, obviously, when I'm running your own company. That's awesome. So now, you're in the thick of it right now. As a founder who's recently raised capital for a successful company, was there anything during the fundraising process that surprised you? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> a lot surprised me. I think the, the biggest kind of uh, surprising piece for me, so we've now raised three rounds, a seed, an A, and a B. Um, our seed round was $1.5 million, and that was significantly, significantly eons harder than the $20 million Series B round. Mm. Um, so I think that first round was just incredibly difficult. And um, that was super surprising to me. And I think it was so crucial to find a group of investors who truly did align with our vision. And you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I can now say that we did that. But back then, I think I was like, anybody who says yes is going to be fine with me. Um, but we did end up finding investors who were very aligned with our vision for the business um, and really trusted me as a founder to take it through the next couple of phases. And then you know, both our A and our B were actually preempted by two existing investors. So that was an amazing situation where, you know, we didn't, we were kind of, we had been giving updates to, um, to our investors on a regular, regular kind of quarterly basis. And we had, um, three insane growth years, um, actually five consecutive years of 300% year over year growth every year. Um, so just like, you know, went from super low and slow business, growing it profitably, very, very, like three people kind of in my basement to all of a sudden enormous growth. Um, and, and those rounds were totally different than that first round. And I think when I look back, I'm just so pleased that we chose investors who um, kind of were vision aligned, values aligned. Um, you know, I had I've had three kids in the last seven years, so the years of, of creating the business. Um, and I think a huge thing for me was, which I didn't realize at the time, was picking investors who also had young kids and were going through a similar um, phase. Um, because as you mentioned, you know, entrepreneurship is incredibly intense. But you know, I had a, a lead investor who, as we were closing our Series A, she was giving birth and I was giving birth. And um, it, was, it was just pivotal to have chosen those investors that were going through similar life phases too, which isn't always possible, but it was great. I want to ask a little off the track question. So as a female founder, did you, um, did you see any specific um, challenges that you've had just as a female founder or you know, being a mom? Yeah, I mean, look, I I think I think there were a ton. I think the the most interesting thing to me though is the was the sector. Um, you know, you say you run a fashion company, people are like, oh, that's so cute, love it, you look great. And I think proving to investors that we were like a really incredible, viable business that had real value for them was a mountain I didn't think would be so difficult to get over. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like cute business and I think fashion and retail in particular, despite the fact that they create billions of dollars for the global economy, have a lot of that. So I think all of that's wrapped into um, the difficulties of being a female founder, but I thought the fashion thing was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Eli, you took a different route. You built a successful business and sold part of it while remaining CEO of, the, of the, another uh, division. 
What led you to that path? Um, all right, I'm going to answer this on a personal and also a really practical level. Um, so on the practical level, um, two parts of that. One of them is that uh, we've been running Desmos for about 12 years. You said seven years is a long time. Uh, seven years sounds like a little bitty baby to me. Um, and I want to run this for a lot longer. And there's some stuff where timelines are just really hard. Um, we had the most possible mission aligned investors who were willing to be very patient. And even they are operating on timelines that that just doesn't work for. There's all sorts of other stuff in this space, like you issue options to employees. Those expire after 10 years, and you need to exercise them. Like, the system is just not built for companies that last a long time. So we needed to do something. Um, but the bigger reason was that I realized that the two businesses were just wildly different from each other. And in fact, like, conflictingly different. We sell our calculator to everyone that we can. We've got 80 customers, the College Board. We, we have the ACT and the SAT and 41 state tests. Um, and we were building a curriculum that competed with like half of those customers. And so on one hand, we're like, you should license from us. On the other hand, we're like, we want to crush you. And it turns out that that's just like a really tough situation. And the go-to-market was totally different. One of them is really sales and marketing heavy. It's, you know, like shaking the right hands and getting into the right smoke-filled rooms. And the other one is build a great product that people find on the internet. It seems like some people in this room have. Um, and so the types of team we needed, it just, they were pulling in these, in these opposing directions. So there were a lot of practical reasons to split them. Um, but the personal reasons, which I feel like have been alluded to with like a very positive frame, and I'm going to give you the negative frame. Um, running a company is awful. Like, <laughs> don't do it unless you really, really love it. It is incredibly hard. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that my mom, who's in this room, and many friends um, were like, Eli, you are literally killing yourself running this business. And I also couldn't imagine not running this business. Um, and I always thought that like the better that we did, the less stressful it would be. You know, we raise a big round of funding, and then like, great, now we don't need to worry about money. But instead, you got to worry about those investors, right? Our usage doubles, and we're like, cool, we're not at risk of running out of users. But now you've got twice as many people to please. And so it was this challenge for me of how do I keep doing this thing that I absolutely, absolutely love? I love this business. I love this product. I love our users. But get off of this trajectory that was like, I think, literally aging me two years every year. I don't know if other people have felt this. Um, so talk to a few friends. And one of them had this very creative idea, which, you know, we were at 80 people at that point, And I'm like, I loved it when it was 20. She's like, maybe you can get back to being 20. Um, and, and we were able to pull it off. It was extremely lucky that we found a customer that was, or a, a partner that was willing to buy just part of our business and split our brand. And all of our lawyers, the, the things that they said, they're like, we've never seen this before. Um, it's going to be a case study someday. And we don't know yet if it's going to be like, everyone should do this, or if it's like, here's why no one does this. And <laughs> <laughs> that was our path. OK. OK, so Scott, your most recently CEO GoDaddy served on a number of corporate boards and are now interim CEO of uh, GoodRx. As someone who steps into a, a lead at later stages with a focus on scale, what motivates you? And how do you typically work with teams? Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, it's funny listening to just Eli's story. You could multiply that number of people by 100, and it's the same, like, it's the same answers. And I think back to what, what is motivating me personally, um, I, I, this is again, it's a personal answer. I, I've always liked uh, s like solving problems that were a little bit of a zag. Uh, and so that means like something that isn't the coolest thing in the world uh, and then uh, but is real, I, I, I've always been I, I've just always been drawn to those kinds of things. And so, you know, f back to company scale, my own motivation. One is, you know, something I can believe in. Number two is something that I personally can help build and evolve. And maybe part of, you know, if I reflect back on my own time, it, you know, every company that I've gotten associated with is like going to its second act. Uh, not because anything was wrong with the first act, but, but there's something else out there that personally is just super motivating to me. Uh, and, and maybe this is advice for everybody, whether you're thinking about an idea or whether you're in it now, whether it's small or whether it's big, having something intuitively in your head that is just a belief 
in the problem that you're solving or the benefit you're providing, it, it, it's the juice, right? It's not only going to be the thing that gets you from like three people to 15, but it's going to be 1,000 to 10,000 because you're really motivating people to go build something together and your own intuitive vision and passion for, hey, what can this become is going to be not only setting the standards for what you go build, but it'll be how you draw everybody together and how you motivate people and how you gra you know, just get everybody fired up. And so, uh, you know, that's a personal answer to what motivates me. And, you know, honestly, if you were listening a little bit, that's a little bit of the tricks of how you scale. Because uh, it really is about aligning people towards what what's out there again, whether it's small to the next stage, and then just creating the people and teams in place to go get there, and then rinse, rat, lathering, repeat, into the point that everybody said, "You're it, 24/7, 365. It's the job, and it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do, ever." And it's also the most draining. Uh, and hopefully, you got to create ways that it gives you energy versus making it enervating. So, I have another question. So, how do you go from internet company to RX pharmaceutical? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be short on this one. Uh, you know, it is a. It, it's an. App. If people know good RX, it's an app. So it is a consumer internet company, but in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality, it's, uh, there's a couple private equity firms that I've worked with for a long time uh, that, again, have been in the business. And it had been run by a couple founders who were looking for ways to, let's call it, exit or move on in some ways. And so I was invited in to help kind of shape a second act by people that I've worked with in the past that I trust. So I'm picking up healthcare fast, yeah. <laughs> um, and I won't go in my you know commentary about healthcare and holy smokes, like <laughs> why it's not logical and how much better it could be if it were logical. So anyway, all right, Rajav, um, you are very involved with Accelerator Yale and are the manage managing partner of your own fund. Can you tell us about it and how you think about investing in early stage efforts? So I've been. Um, investing in companies and advising companies but let me tell you starting a company is totally different so you can work with startups but doing a startup is its own thing mm -hmm. and I think the most important consideration for for anyone is really this intersection between your own passion and the problem statement so in my particular case it dawned upon me that what the world doesn't need needs many things, but what it doesn't need, perhaps, is another equity hedge fund. Now, in an area that I had been intrigued by, had been personally involved in for a number of years as it relates to digital assets and, and blockchain, this is an area where institutional focus and having a professional service for those who want exposure to what's now a trillion dollar asset class in a proper way is a problem. And so bringing those things together was a key consideration. And in seeing startups that, that did well, had various arcs and trajectories, what I saw was really that personal enthusiasm and, and passion, which was not related to any particular cycle, but actually determined the ultimate outcome and scaling of a business. So in my experience, in having been a part of large investment firms and gotten the reps in committing capital, the next step was in, in starting a firm, bringing all of those lessons, not just in investing, but also in seeing what businesses operationally did to make things work. And uh, people are just as important. So my business partner and I worked together at the same hedge fund for a number of years. And uh, it's, it's all the ingredients that go into, uh, into the cooking. It's not just one particular output, which as an investor or advisor to startups, you can be much more narrow in. Interesting. Nora, uh, as the technical founder and CEO of Neritus, you're in a unique position. Can you share a bit about your pathway from PhD to founder? Yeah. It's not easy. I think Eli puts it really well. Um, but for me, 
um, it was a choice at the beginning. So, you know, part of my career was in the academic sector. And even though it was kind of on the borders of industry, it was still academic. And the choices there were, do I continue doing this research and publish papers, peer-reviewed papers, and maybe potentially people will read it and eventually someone will take it and commercialize it. So that was one option. Uh, or leave university and actually build it. And I knew it was hard. It wasn't a, a, a dream or any. I knew quite a few entrepreneurs and I, I, I knew how hard it can be. And that was the choice I made. Um, because I knew that by staying in the academic sector that that idea may never see the light of day. And, um, and you may get good impact factor uh, peer-reviewed papers, but it won't really see the day. So I, I left university, and this is how I started to build Neurotas. And I can see it in three phases. So biotech really has three phases that I see. Phase one is research. Phase two is development, and phase three is commercial. Though there are obviously more phases, but those are the major phases. And each phase demands a complete different uh, way of thinking. And very few people can adapt, especially I come from a complete academic scientific background. Um, but I think it's very, very important as well for biotech, for the CEO and, and the person leading the biotech to actually understand the technology. They need to understand the limits of that technology. They need to understand what that technology can become, how we can integrate with other technologies. So I think it's very, very important for a CEO of a company, especially a biotech especially in the early days, to understand the technology and how it's going. So that was fine from an, from a, from an R or research perspective. Development phase was different because you had to bring all the scientists on this journey of, okay, you can't be testing. And, and once a molecule has gone through all this research and you've done your clinicals and you've proved the efficacy of your molecule, now we need to move into a phase of development where a lot of these testing when you scale your, your product and, and, and it's going to be launched, that product then comes back to the company where we have to do small tests on it. And usually that takes about six months. Now, obviously, that's not commercially viable because each batch needs to be tested. So you have to move from, a, from an R&D thinking into a very clear development thinking where a lot of these need to be shortened. And you have to bring all these scientists on the journey with you. And I think what helped me personally to transition is that mathematical background and, and looking at it as literally the objective changes, the goal changes. Um, that's it. We just need to adapt to what that um, period needs. So that was the development phase. Um, and then there's a the commercial phase. And now it's all about revenue and, and, and growing revenue. And, and it's about putting together a team of, of, of really good you know, BD individuals, development individuals, and so forth, regulatory, and really growing and, and understanding how the market works, how do you s reduce the sales cycle, etc. And that's, again, a different, a different mindset. But all these phases, I think what's important is adaptation. Uh, I, I was lucky to adapt, but I've seen a lot that have not adapted and, and were very good at one phase and not the other. Um, and and it, it demands a lot of flexibility. So it's super hard, but it's, it's also, it demands superb flexibility. It demands a lot of listening to the markets and, and what the clients actually are looking for. Um, and actually it demands also you bringing people with you because obviously from a, going from an R&D, uh, to a commercial company, you have to bring the team with you as well in terms of the thinking um, and, and, and scaling and so forth. So that's really my transition. Uh, it, it's not easy. It's, it was hard, but I think it's doable because a lot of scientists tell me, you know, um, it must be super hard. And it is for, for anyone, I think for anyone, whether your technical background or not. Um, but it's totally doable. It's just the objective changes. The objective of academia is to publish. Once you become a commercial, the objective is not really to publish. It's to get something to market quickly and to scale it. And then it changes and you just need to adapt. Flexibility is a very important part of entrepreneurship. Awesome. So are you guys ready to open this up to the audience? And I'm sure they all have questions. Anyone? Have questions? Back. I feel like I'm Oprah Winfrey. Sure. No, no, no. Oh, I got okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Actually, a lot of, I think, things that you mentioned, especially about how 
difficult it is to be an entrepreneur was really quite interesting for me because I'm a uh, rising freshman at Yale this year and I was kind of I guess hoping to kind of get into this kind of entrepreneurial world so I was wondering if you had any advice should I you know just like stay away like don't do this go like pursue CS or maybe some like <laughs> you know, if you had any advice on maybe how I would approach this um, and stuff like that that would be really cool thank you so much I'll ju while I have the microphone, I'll just say one thing. Uh, I think it's always good to work in a startup first, just to get to know what it is, um, the, understand the speed of it, the the pressures, and and I think it's the best way. It's the best way to move forward. It's a great question. I don't think there's any right answer on timing. So we have this uh, in modern times, at least this romanticized view of a lot of founders being very, very young. But if you look at the data, a lot of successful businesses across industries have a first-time founder that's in their 40s. And this wasn't clear to me at all for a long time. And so I think that the entrepreneurship, however you define it, can also be within a larger business, if you're running a business, if you're starting a new business line. so. I would just keep you know the whole array of options open, and ultimately it comes down to your idea and all of the factors that go into uh, beginning that, whether it's an organization or whether it's a standalone product or or whatever it is. So uh, my view would be uh, keep flexibility, and there's pros and cons to every single part of the life spectrum. If you do it later, perhaps you get all the control and capital isn't an issue, and at the same time you have all the other challenges and your time frame is different. Um, and, and so uh, there's no one size fits all. You just have to play it by ear. But if you have the interest, you can always continue developing that, keep your eyes and ears open, and, uh, and when the time is right, in some ways you'll know it. I uh, just want to add on to there's no one pathway. Um, for example, I maybe wish I'd worked at a startup. Probably I wouldn't have done this if I had. But I didn't. <laughs> and I'm really, really glad that, that I didn't. Because I, I see friends who worked at other startups. And every startup has its own culture. And most of them are totally busted. Because most of them are run by people who have no idea what they're doing. Which was definitely me 10 years ago. Um, so this advice is extremely personal. And for me, the key was that it was a complete accident. And I think for a lot of my friends who have started companies successfully, it's the same thing. I did not think this was going to be a company. I wanted to be a physics professor. That was kind of always, always my dream. Um, and instead, I just kind of like fell in love with this specific problem, even when it was really small. Um, and, and that is the way for me that I've managed to get through the days that are really hard. And there are many of those is... I wake up and I get to like go work on a piece of software that I love, or I get to go on Twitter before it turned into a cesspool and like see people saying nice things about our product and people who I really cared about. Um, and so when the days are hard, like running a company to me is not intrinsically motivating at all, but like having a kid enjoy math a little bit more than they did before really is. And so finding the thing that, that does that for you as opposed to finding a company um, is, is at least my personal advice. So, my question is in regard to um, starting a business. Um, some of you, you know, I guess the the it's going from dorm room to IPO. Um, did any of you face like like the imposter syndrome? You know, when you started your business and kind of like feeling like, well, I don't know what I'm doing and or you kind of know what you're doing, but you have an idea, you have a passion, you have a love. There's an issue, but there's a problem in the in the, um, in the industry, and you have a solution. But then you feel like, well, I've never really run a business, so how do I put this, present this to the world? Yeah, so ha happy to take that. Um, so I was a senior senior at Yale, so um, and the only industry I knew was college problems, right? And so we started a company to fix kind of college back offices. And I think the way we sort of did that, because we didn't, you know, we were all in our early 20s, we didn't really know how to run a business, but we did know is how to motivate kind of a team. And so we brought on lots of people to the team that were much older than us. So we brought on a CTO that was, I think, probably around 40. We brought in a VP of sales was around 40. 
Um, eventually, we actually, two years in, we brought in a CEO for our company that was also 20 years older than us. And so I think that was our way to sort of learn is bring in all these people who knew a lot more than we did and learn from them. And then ultimately, our, you know, our CEO at the time, who's now a very good friend of mine and my business partner in the venture fund, he left the year after we went public. Um, I became CEO of the public company. Um, and my co-founder became CEO of the public company. And so it's interesting. We learned from all those people along the way. Um, and we knew what we didn't know, and we brought in people to fix that. So I think it's really important. And I'm not saying everybody needs to bring in a CEO and a whole team, but bring in advisors and bring in expertise and knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and focusing on those areas is really, really important. Because I think founders, and we see this all the time. So now being on the VC side, I look at over 2,000 opportunities a year um, as a team. So our team looks at 2,000. And I see founders who come in and... One of the biggest mistakes people make is to pretend they know everything, and they don't. Nobody can know everything. And so the key is to focus on the areas you're expert on, and then bring in people to help you with the other pieces. Hey, can I? Scott, may I, I, just, uh, I have, um, I, I think I'm probably the oldest person on this panel and maybe around it. Uh, imposter syndrome, if anybody says they don't feel inadequate like on what they're doing and look around sometimes and feel like, oh my God, am I ready for this? They're not. <laughs> so uh, one advice is, uh, is if you feel like, yeah, honestly, you, if, if you're waiting to be ready and particularly for somebody else to tell you you're ready, like, it'll forget it. <laughs> and, and so the like advice uh, even on teams, people, uh, bet on like bet on content. So like the comment of you got to know what you're doing. Bet on integrity and bet on design. And for everything around, who do you want to surround yourself with? It's just those three things. And so to to me, honestly, the people who have been there, done that, and seen like, and certainly give off the air that that's what's necessary. I personally kind of reject them, <laughs> uh, truly, from it, which is, oh my gosh, go for content, like just talent, desire, integrity. And you know what? Like, if you're feeling like, oh, I haven't done that, you know what? You'll figure it out. Like, really, you'll figure it you'll, you'll always figure it out. And when you say content, are you referring to like, um, data that's out there? No, no, oh, just like whatever you're trying to solve. Like just some some aspect of whatever your ideas or the situation around it. Do you have something of, you know, immediate value that you're adding to it? So for example, in, you know, in the in, in the North business, I, I would add zero value to the molecular. So uh, that would reject me from <laughs> being able to really help out there. Uh, but there's, you know, again, it's finding that match of, oh, do you have instinct and, you know, like just a capability to whatever your idea is or whatever, you know, whatever the task is. I think this is really important, what, what yeah. Scott is saying. Like, it's normal. It's normal to feel that way. It's just normal. I think we all felt it, uh, and we feel it in and out. So there's periods where we feel it more because it's totally new, and we have to learn it. And I think surround yourself with the right people is very important. I made mistakes bringing people in sometimes with massive CVs, and they knew even less. So, so, and, and then initially you're like, well, they should know. They're like 30 years more experience and, and they should know, but actually they don't know. And, and you, re, you, don't, you don't realize that at the beginning because you're not listening to your gut. You're like, no, they should know because obviously I, I, I don't know this area. They know it. But then you, you, you build confidence and you realize that you know your area much better and you, you've, you've heard the clients, you've heard the industry and you know it. And, and yes, you have to bring in good people into the company, but you also have to do your own homework as well and realize that you don't know everything and you have to go out and ask customers and understand what they're looking for and so forth and adapt to it. So, um, so yes, the solution is to bring in good people, but it's not always the solution either. Um, so yeah, I'll stop here. Um, I've, I've got a kind of hot take on this one. Um, so I think nobody really knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and some people are given all sorts of signals that they probably know what they're doing. And I'm one of those people. Like, we started around the same time that the social network came out. And so I'd go into investment meetings, and they'd be like, oh, a nerdy, like, Jewish boy from an Ivy League school who looks like that 
Like, you probably know what you're doing. Um, and, and I didn't. Like, Sam Bankman Freed managed to raise a whole bunch of money on an absolute fraud just because he looked the part. And so when I think about imposter syndrome, I think a whole lot of the signals that everyone is given, um, some of us are given signals all the time that we probably know what we're doing, and some of us are given signals that we don't. And I heard this from Nell a little bit at the beginning of, like, investors maybe not taking you seriously, maybe because you're a woman, maybe because you're in fashion. Because I look cute. Because you look cute. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and maybe the people who should feel imposter syndrome more don't, and a lot of people who do probably shouldn't. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm just about to like hit my first year like as a founder and all you're saying about like the amount of work is like I very much felt it like this year for the first time and I also went to law school before and people say law school is hell and you have to work way way harder <laughs> in a startup than law school. But I was just wondering um, I found that I've had to like reevaluate everything in my life including my routine and everything just to maintain that level of productivity and I wonder if you guys had any input about like habits or things that you did that were very helpful so that you could be you know seven days a week constantly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can talk a little about that. I mean, I think it's it's really a personal sort of, you know, thing to think about what works for you and how do you incorporate what's important to you into sort of your routine and your business. So, for example, you know, working out. And I talk to a lot of founders and they say, oh, I don't have time anymore to go to the gym. I don't do this. So what we did um, at Hire One is we actually had, you know, built a, an office and we built a big gym right at the entrance. And I made it a point to be there at 8 in the morning and do my workout from 8 to 9 as people were coming into the office. And I'd see people, I'd talk to people on the way out while I was doing my workout. And it sort of became part of my routine of seeing people, um, you know, almost like greeting people as they were coming in, trying to guilt them into using the gym. You know, and that was part of our theme at the company is we were trying to write healthy environment. So I think part of it is like thinking about what's important to you, what do you want to do, and how do you adjust that to fit. And how do you, you know, maybe take, you know, time off between 6 and 8 p.m. And then you work again from 8 to whenever you need to to finish whatever you need to do. If that's important to you or you want to spend time with your family. or So I think it's really a very personal decision how to make it fit. And again, now having a portfolio of CEOs, every one of them deals with things differently. Some people call me at 10 o'clock at night and other people text me at 6 in the morning. And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this might be a hot take, but I think therapy is like the most important thing you could possibly do as a founder and as a human. Um, I think my I, I meet with my therapist every week, and I think we talk a lot about boundary setting. I think that gets thrown around a lot, but I think it is incredibly important to be absolutely ruthless with your boundaries for what matters. Otherwise, as a founder and as a CEO, like you guys were all talking about managing teams earlier, you just be, live a defensive life, right? Everything gets thrown at you, and you're just doing things that other people want, and nothing is offensive. And I know for me personally, um, I... I never would have learned some of the lessons I learned if I hadn't been forced to by having kids at such such a young age. Um, and I think I, I came from the perspective of literally I had little people who like my relied on my body to stay alive. And so even if I had the most important deal in the world or the most important like lawyer call or whatever, I literally had to choose the other thing. And I think that perspective kind of like shocked me into realizing actually some of this stuff is not the most important thing happening in the world right now. And that really kind of uh, reoriented me in times that um, were super stressful. So I don't think you have to have kids to do that. But I do think it's important to have that like constant check-in and therapy really helps with that. To reorient yourself, remind yourself of your perspective and really, really take the time to figure out what's important to you. It's different for everybody, right? Like working out is punishment for me, so that would be awful. But um, for some people that's super important, right? Um, and figuring out what that is and ruthlessly protecting it is, is crucial. I'd say don't forget the upside of being a founder. You know, if, uh, if you don't like your boss, you can talk to your boss and change your boss. You're your boss. So the, the benefits, I think, are often lost. And so the 24-7 element of it is well known. Now, the offset is being able to do things at times 
that may suit you, which in a very structured environment or being pinned down to specific market hours, um, I sort of over time realized was what was missing. So having two young kids myself, I'm able to, again, protect that time, which is important for the other parts of my life. And that's a pretty nice offset where in the aggregate, your energy level is higher for sure. And the demands are much higher. But you can create the jigsaw puzzle a bit as you see fit. So that's how I see the, the trade-off on, on both of those elements. Can we have a question? Yes. Over here. Well, thank you all for, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Bad timing. <laughs> Call yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you all for your insights, and uh, nice to see you again, Dr. Caldi. My name is Tom Cavalier. I work at Advanced CT, uh, which is economic development for the state of Connecticut. So I would be curious uh, if each of you could talk, or, or wherever it is relevant, about where you choose to start your company uh, and how that plays into your deliberations and uh, you know projections for your future growth. Thanks. Um, so we started off in Ireland, okay, and the reason, um, it, there was a choice at that time, it was between Ireland and the US, and we chose Ireland because at that time the environment was good and the access to talent was actually pretty good. There was a lot of governmental help as well, especially at the early stages in biotech, it's important. So hence, um, hence that, plus there's a lot of tax incentives, and you've, you must have heard of Ireland from a tax incentive perspective. Uh, and if you haven't, you should look at that as well. <laughs> I'm not stealing from Connecticut, but I, I think it's important. So we started off in Ireland, and, and that was really good, because we had access to talent, uh, access to uh, governmental help, um, and, and regulatory friendly environments as well. What happened then is from a scaling, a scaling perspective, so once we reached the commercial stage, once we knew our ingredients were coming through their clinical success and, and now being launched and scaled, we chose the US as our main market, um, simply because of the, um, uh, again, regulatory, a lot of the clinicals were actually held in, in the US. Um, and also the market size and, and regulatory market size, access to talent from a commercial perspective. And this is why we chose the US. We looked at different geographies in the US. We chose Connecticut. And actually, um, being totally honest with you, it would have been a very different um, uh, location prior to COVID. So prior to COVID, Boston was where we were going to go. But after COVID, things changed because people were looking out of those main uh, hubs and talent was more accessible in other areas. It was also a little cheaper to actually live in these areas. Um, access to um, to you know labs and 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 facilities was was better. So we looked at different areas and we chose Connecticut as our hub. And Connecticut CT was really helpful that way. They showed us actually one of the things that really. Um, helped us as a company was that, and it was very different from other geographies in the US. They showed us an Excel sheet with all the companies in, all the companies and all the academics within Connecticut and how they connected to Neurotas. So based on keyword searches. So they connected Neurotas to all the ecosystem here from, okay, here are the large companies you should be connected with. Here are the smaller companies you should be connected with. And here are maybe the areas you should actually discuss. So that was really interesting. Um, so from a, what we look at is a lifestyle. Uh, the lifestyle here seemed to be very good from capturing at least talent. Um, and we're seeing that. So that's how we chose the location in, in Connecticut. And if you guys are in Connecticut and like to move here, we'd <laughs> be happy to have a conversation. Uh, thank you all. All very interesting stuff that you're doing. Um, from the standpoint, and I think it was originally um, Nell who, who brought this up as far as partnering and having great partners that you work with, whether it's investors, et cetera, or people working with you. From um, if And this is more for those that are now investors and have now moved to that end. But if you can just talk about um, what you look for in partnerships and really just, um, because great fit is important. This is my second rodeo from a founding standpoint. So, you know, bumps in the road with former investors and partners, so I'd love any thoughts or insights you can share. 
Yeah, so I would say, I mean, that's, it's really, really important piece for both sides, for the investors and the entrepreneurs to find a good fit and a match. So, and I think some investors take that more seriously than others. Um, um, we actually really focus on it. We spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs. And it's a combination of, you know, having the same vision for the business is really important. So if you're trying to make it a billion dollar business and your investors want to sell it when you get to 50 million, there's going to be a mismatch, right? So that's the more simple sort of match on the business perspective, the same growth plan, the same vision for the business. But then there's also just a, you know, approach perspective, right? Do you get along with the investor? Do you want to work with this person for the next five to seven years, right? Um, you know, and how does the firm work? Right? What are their incentives? What's the timing in their fund? There's so many different pieces. And that's, again, we spend a lot of time with the entrepreneurs. I like to take folks out for dinner and drinks and lunch. And I, you know, it's, it's the informal conversations. You learn a lot about what gets people ticking because you can put on a performance in a 30 minute meeting or a one hour meeting or even on Zoom for a long time. But, you know, you go out, have lunch, have dinner, have drinks. It's really hard to put up a charade. And, you know, we always compare it a little bit to getting married, right? People go on lots of dates before they get married, and you can undo the marriage probably a lot easier than most VC investments. It's really hard <laughs> to undo an investment. You're stuck with that investor for a really long time. And so that process of getting to know each other is really important. And I think a lot of investors, particularly now with hybrid and remote and Zoom, have gotten very lazy um, and don't do enough on that part and really make sure there's a match. But I would say that's one of the most important things. Check out people's references for the investors. We check out entrepreneur references. You should be checking out our references. Talk to our portfolio company CEOs. They're easy to find. Um, so these are the things that good entrepreneurs will do, and we actually encourage that. So I think it's really important. Yeah, let me come in with a little bit of sharp because I'm, you know, one of these reformed investment guys who actually had to do something like normally it goes the other way. So I'll give you a couple of advice that I give people in that spot. Number one is, uh, is tactical. I hate preference. Like literally, so any investor who asks for special terms that aren't aligned is not, I think, a good steward of whatever you're trying to do. So there's a lot of people who are like, whoa, you just messed up my fund. Uh, I think it's horrible. So I think there's a cleanness in everybody being side by side that is, it's not a good business principle, it's great life principle. So alignment, not in words, but in everything that happens to me would be, you know, advice number one. Uh, and advice number two on finding an investor would be, uh, an individual that doesn't need your specific thing to work out because an agitated investor who believes that they like that are wrapped up in your thing is an anxious and unproductive one. And so you want the person who actually doesn't need you to work out and they're going to be a far better provider of whether it's advice or comfort, you know, or temperament uh, uh, around it. But so those are, you know, again, as the reform guy, th those are the two specific pieces of advice I'd give you. I can, yeah, I can add some stuff there too. I mean, I think, I think each investor doesn't have to be good for, like they don't all need to be good for the same things, right? It's almost like you think of friends, like some investors are good for some things, some are good for others. And I think for us, particularly our relationship with our lead in the first two rounds was the relationship that I wanted to be the best and that it continues to be the best. It's an incredible relationship. And I think one of the things that's been amazing to watch is how they reacted when things have been going haywire. So when Silicon Valley Bank had their nice little Friday, like the way that that firm reacted towards their portfolio companies was very, very different than the way some other big VC funds reacted. And it was like all hands on deck, what can we wire? How can we help you guys? Um, and I mean, that's like, you know, that's incredible. Um, so I think like, you know, your lead, especially if you're doing rounds like us where there's like kind of one big guy or girl, <laughs> um, you want that, um, that lead to be able to help you in bad situations. Um, and then I think there are other measures that are good for other things. I totally agree with that point is you don't want to be somebody's prize horse. Like it's just too much pressure and they will become very agitating. 
Um, and then I think for investors, it's really important to know, it's almost like this imposter syndrome thing, right? It's important to know what your specific investing expertise can actually do. I have some investors who the like, how can I be helpful thing? It's like somebody told them that on a panel once and I'm like, I don't need any help right now. Like I really need you to stop emailing me. Um, so I think knowing what you are really good at and whether that's actually helpful to the company is really, really good. Um, and yeah, just being a general, like not a jerk is a big plus. <laughs> yeah, so I have... One last question before we have to wrap up. This is from Mark and Rajav. Um, what type of businesses, I know early stage, what type of businesses are you investing in? Just for the audience, they may want to know. Yeah, so we invest in uh, B2B software, enterprise SaaS type businesses at the seed stage, seed to series A, it sort of depends these days on what you call it, but we generally lead three to $5 million rounds um, where we do about 50% of the round and then we bring in other investors to kind of value add expertise to the rounds. That's kind of what we do anywhere in the East Coast. So oh, okay. um, Florida to Boston and kind of all the way. Along. Yeah, we can be multi-asset in nature, but blockchain is the focus. So a uh, combination of liquid and uh, can also do private investing and uh, protocols and token projects that are going to list. So it's a mix of things, but for us, there, there also has to be strong continuity from the best of what we've done as portfolio managers, which is in the liquid markets, macro, et cetera. So a lot of things coming together and um, no specific check size, but tends to be very early stage for uh, blockchain projects. Okay. So I think this wrap, oh, we have to get to yeah, so I think this uh, wraps things up. Uh, Mark, Nell, Ely, Scott, Rajab, and Nora, amazing companies. And if you all could give them a hand of applause.
We started YF. So part of it is by starting YF, we made a lot of relationships. So that helped us out to be able to be in the New York. I learned a lot by starting YF. It was learning. Go to Marty. 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 Go Hello. Okay, we're going to start up. Okay, 